Texas Lutheran University. It's really good to see all of you here. I feel a lot of excitement. It's been really, really fun listening to the morning, morning speakers. And I would like to introduce our next keynote. Her name is Dr. Josephine Mendez Negrete. She is an associate professor in Mexican American Studies at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She received her PhD at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Her autoethnographic testimonio, Las Hijas de Juan, Daughters Betrayed, was published by Duke University Press as a revised edition in 2006 and was reprinted in 2010. Her current manuscript, A Life on Hold, La Historia de Tico, a Testimonio of Schizophrenia in the Context of Liz Lived Experience, documents the struggle faced by her eldest son who suffers from illness and her family who loves and supports him. She has published in Frontiers, Journal of Women's Studies, Journal of Latinos in Education. In addition to serving as the lead editor for Chicana Latina Studies, the Journal of Mujeres Activas en Letras y Cambio Social, Mendez Negrete continues to explore Afro-Mexicanidad through a play about Maria del Carmen Peregrino Alvarez, or Doña La Negra, which she developed as a two or one woman show. As a community activist, Mendez Negrete has a history of activism in organizations that promote the welfare of women and children. I've known Dr. Mendez Negrete for over 20 years. Though I was never an official student of uh, Dr. Mendez Negrete, I have learned much, much, much from, from her. She effortless, effortlessly combines her role as professor, teacher, mentor, activist, and scholar. She understands that for first generation students of color, finding a support network is crucial to their success. When I first met Dr. Mendez Negrete, I was a graduate student at Washington State University. During the first few minutes of our conversation, she gave me her full attention as she asked, how are they treating you there? Do you have any faculty mentors? Have you found a support network? Do you have people that you can talk to? How is your family doing? And from then on, every time I, I see her, she would never forget who I was. She gave me her contact information. She told me to email her and to contact her at any time if I had absolutely any questions. Since then, as I have become more involved with Chicana Chicano Studies conferences and circles, I have come to know many Chicanas and Latinas and women of color who have benefited from her mentorship and who have learned from her example. And I would like to add that uh, Dr. Mendez Negrete has been promoted to full professor starting September 1st. So please let us welcome Dr. Linda Negrete. The title of her talk is Relational Knowledge in Chicana Chicano Studies, Oh, Conociéndonos in Interaction. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, well, I'm pretty loud, so I'll give it distance. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's really amazing to drive through your city. It took me back to the San Joaquin Valley and the little streets um, and the little roads of Ceres, California, and other communities where my family has lived or worked the fields. Um, thank you for the welcome. I extend my appreciation and thanks to Texas Lutheran University and the conference organizing committee for inviting me, especially Dr. Jennifer Mata, whom I thoroughly admire and respect for her commitment and the work that she does with students. It is truly an honor to be amongst you. With my presentation, Conociéndonos and Interaction, Relational Knowledge in Chicana Chicano Studies, I share the ways in which I establish a collaborative and participatory ambiance to co-create a safe and inviting space for social learning through conocimiento. Let me begin with my teaching philosophy. It is my belief that human beings are not just biological systems or empty vessels to fill out with knowledge. They are historical beings 
who come to know themselves in the context of generalized and specific messages about who they are in the ways they learn to understand whether they belong or not in our society. I start with a belief that students are not empty vessels and that they bring knowledge into the classroom. Thus, my charge as a professor is to aid them in uncovering and reconnecting with their historical legacies, whether as members of the majoritarian group or as members of an ethnic minority group. For that reason, in my courses, I start with a retrieval of personal histories all the way to maternal and paternal great grandparents. For it is in these historical spaces that knowledge unfolds to provide an understanding of our identities. Through this process, the students begin to understand that they are sociocultural beings that have internalized messages of the self in the context of structural constraints and systemic limitations of race, gender, socioeconomic status, racialized ethnicity, and sexuality, amongst others. The social structures are but a few of the systems of inequality that students embody and must uncover in themselves by examining their family legacies. As students become aware of the ways in which these structures have shaped their family history, a newfound knowledge emerges for them, creating a relational consciousness that evolves in learning interactions that make us critical aware and self-knowledgeable. For it is in our relational interactions and inside our examination of social cultural experiences that we're able to gauge our subjectivities to more clearly know the world in which we find ourselves. Let me offer that human beings engage social structures and system that constrained as they as they struggle to access opportunities and places and spaces that because of the accident of birth, some gain privilege and entitlement, while others become relegated to a life of subordination. The socialization process that shaped us have taken place in notions of what we lack or what we are not. Therefore, relational, as relational beings, we must reclaim our humanity, which can happen in two ways. Can you tell I'm nervous? That I, I flubbed it a couple of times. First, we learn to engage one another in the process of creating change. Second, as relational beings, we must necessarily uncover and negotiate the environment. This allows us to understand what it means to be in the world as human beings in the context of a multiplicity of assigned or self-selected identities. In the case of those whose histories have been veiled or dismissed, identity does matter. In all its multiple, contextual, situational, fluid, and complex ways. It is through the agency of identity that students understand who they are. This is the first time they see themselves as historical or ethnic kings that have had to negotiate empty categories assigned to them while erasing or distorting historical connections to their culture and their people. For the first time, students comprehend that not all people of Mexican origin are immigrants as they make connections to their roots and gain awareness that they do not want to reject their indigeneity or their cultural legacies. Let me elaborate. As I take you on a journey of conocimiento, a process that facilitates the retrieval of, hem of family history to place lived experience in the context of social history. Conocimiento begins with each person as an individual unit of the family in interaction to their relational connections. I emphasize that the conocimiento guides I use, which, are being which will be screened in a while, are not intended for enter entertainment purposes. And while they may serve as empirical tools for collecting data, conocimiento guides are living instruments with which we retrieve knowledge that has been lost or hidden from sight. With this approach to learning, choice becomes a real option. 
as students begin to uncover and make visible those fears, secrets, or shames that have kept our family histories or traumas hidden or silent, forever leaving us inside the ambivalence of our identity and masking who we are. I convey that to become our own or society's agents, we cannot hide in the fear of the unknown. Rather, as critical co-learners, we must confront our fears as teachers and learners, because we are both. Sometimes we, lo we learn more from our students exponentially, because they bring into the process of knowledge multiple histories and cultures that may, we may or may not know. Conocimiento creates the possibility of self in another confrontation as we unpack the contradictions of living in despair, self-loathing, and, and hopelessness, which is most often what first-generation ethnic students who are ill-prepared for college find themselves negotiating as a result of the socio-cultural messages they have, they have internalized as members of derided groups, Mexican, working class, and sexual minorities, for example. With conocimiento, we shift realities by developing an ethical, compassionate strategy with which to negotiate conflict and difference within self and between others to find common ground. Through this co-learning process for self-knowledge, we learn to see the ways in which society and culture have shaped us, to learn to see the ways in which society and culture uh, have given us messages about who we are, starting with the family and those institutions that have molded us, education being the primary from pre-K on. The quest for conocimiento knowledge or se of self through interaction with others is not a comfortable process. For many of us, our histories are mystified or kept hidden. Thus, the content of what we teach will bring up emotions that drive students to question the value of conocimiento as professors who prefer to avoid engaging the emotional knowledge necessary for learning through the body and our emotions shy away from the process. For that reason, as co-facilitators of knowledge, we professors as learners must be ready to engage our emotional intelligence in the process of creating knowledge. It's not just what we know or the expertise we bring onto the table. It is the relationships that we create with our students that change lives. In such a place of responsibility and accountability, we must rest firm in the understanding that unearthing family legacy empowers learners and teachers to gauge their lived experiences within society's structural designs. When you get old, you can't see with glasses and you can't see with them. <laughs> Through conocimiento, consciousness emerges as we get, gain insight and knowledge about whom we are in relationship to the very nation that was founded on notions of freedom, equality, and justice for all. As we critically examine family histories in the context of the social histories we study, examine, and analyze. When I teach, before handing out the conocimiento, the conocimiento, which you will see soon, uh, sometimes I don't just hand out a paper. Sometimes I write chart pack papers and hang them on the wall so that they can engage collective community learning. But I kind of think about doing that on my feet because it may not be a group that I can start with that way and I may have to give them the privacy to come to self-knowledge, especially if it's a mixed group that includes African Americans, Asians, and, and uh, Euro Americans. So, you know, because people usually think, well, she's Mexican American studies, she's only gonna teach about Mexicans, right? When, uh, so before handing the conocimiento, the historia cimiento in this case, so named because this course focuses on the retrieval of family history as a connection to the community and social history of Mexican Americans in the Southwest. I remind students that there are no right or wrong answers as I prod them to write what they know. I'm interested in finding out the gaps in their knowledge. I'm interested in validating the things they know about themselves and their people. And I'm interested in having them expose that knowledge as something that is good for the collective 
and a good place to start. And I encourage them to focus on what they know is valid and to pay attention to what is missing as they retrieve their historical legacies. I clarify that with conocimiento, my intent is to facilitate a process of self-knowledge, emphasizing that there are many ways of knowing and creating knowledge. I offer that conocimiento is about learning and becoming aware about what we know and what we have yet to learn, highlighting that from the process, we will extract knowledge, even from the silences and the losses that emerge in the completion of the conocimiento. I affirm that the activity may bring pain and discomfort, stir up emotion, and expose secrets the family has long kept hidden, such as originating from a long line of undocumented people who came here for a better life. Finally, I express that during the first community sharing, each person will have the option to voice or speak from their conocimiento, warning that if they pass their turn, which is an option they have, that they will also be called upon again to retrieve their story. While self-knowledge guides the course, it is not its sole purpose. Our aim is to minimize risk to help and others in the context of interaction and to extract the social learning relationships that produce complex and deep knowledge. After this, students learn that they are reclaiming the subject and that their writing will be in the I active voice for many, an exercise that they've never had in public school or in community colleges. I informing that the I active voice is necessary for the final assignment, an autoethnography in which they narrate, analyze, and reflect on the legacies from which they originate. I further explain that number one, the course is writing intensive that they will write a total of five essays, with the first three becoming foundational to the autoethnography final, and a, mid a midterm essay that focuses on Chicana Latina history. To support them in their writing, I let them know that the first two essays will be peer reviewed and tracked with story and, e and line edits by me and their peers. As part of their engagement with critical reading and evaluation, students are informed that they will provide story and line editing to each other with emphasis on gaining clarity and understanding about the writing process, not to put down or criticize their peers. In the peer review assignments, students are informed that their task entails giving positive feedback that focuses on strengths and what worked with the essay. Dyads and discussion groups will be used to engage course content and to personalize sharing in smaller venues. In small groups, students with volunteer facilitators and note takers to document the discussion focus on the main idea, argument, or thesis of the reading used to identify the ways in which an author support or illustrate her or his argument. To create comfort and oral literacy in the, court, in the course content. Community lectures where the professor identifies a main idea in the chapter and or article, guides individual contribution, contributions from each and every mem member who will have the option to pass but we, will be called once again. The idea is that, in my experience, the majority of first generation students or Mexican-American students have gotten by making it to the 10% or with good grades by being silent and meek and not disrupting and not expressing their ideas. Where in my class, they don't get to do that. Finally, sorry, students are encouraged to access teaching, learning, and tutorial centers. I emphasize that it's not a shame to use those services and that their fees pay for people to work for them. Therefore, they must go utilize those resources. Finally, I encourage group readings and discussions outside of class so that they can become better prepared for class collaborative learning, making the process of creating knowledge deeper and more intense, thus facilitating social knowledge as a way of learning. So what I wanted to do with my conocimiento as I was talking to you, oops, this little thing is, a, is short, uh, 
And I'm a Mackie, so I have to make sure that I'm working with this technology here. <laughs> it's it's uh, point, uh, protect, uh, protesting. Um, OK, so you already know who I am. I've been introduced. Again, imagine the conocimiento is a chart pack that's pretty big that's on the wall if we're going to do a collaborative <coughs> collective. Generally, one of the deciding factors for if I'm going to do a collaborative is if the students have been in my classes before. And if I have more than half students in my class who have gone through conocimiento with me, because it's not the same conocimiento every time I teach a course. What I do with the course is that I assess the content, what I'm teaching, the courses they're going to be, the books they're going to be reading, the arguments presented in those books, and then what I want to do is I want to see what they know about that content. And so I create a conocimiento that lays a foundation for a common base of knowledge, where they actually get to highlight what they bring to the classroom through the conocimiento. So when I, when it's a group, this was a group of 40 students, okay? I only, I only had three Euro-Americans, but two of the young women kind of got scared and ran. And the vet, uh, my respects to him, who used to try to red beat us a tomato every time we had class discussion, he stayed the course. And so you'll hear a little bit about him in a minute. So I began with self-knowledge, and because I want to create an environment that allows me to have personal relationships, I asked them to give me a name that they like to be called, like Samira wants to be Sam. OK, I'll call her Sam. Um, and then I want to know something about their family. So I have them look at that family uh, to see if there's community activists, if there's leaders, and if there's people in the military. In San Antonio, San Antonio's military town, whether you're from San Antonio or not. And whether I'm a pacifist or not is irrelevant. The life of the people that I'm trying to affirm is important. And if the military was the venue by which they got an education, I have to validate, recognize, and affirm that. So that serves as that. And then I get them right into looking at the social identities and define without telling them this is the definition. There's going to be more. Um, their identities as gender, race, ethnic, and socioeconomic uh, members of structures. And what they do is they tell me stories about the first conscious uh, time that they learned that. Then um, I ask them to identify female or male. Depending on if it's a lower or upper division um, course, I may add cis to the category. And you can talk to me about that if cis is new. And then I ask them what their first language is. Um, why do you think I ask what their first language is? Can somebody take a guess? OK, good. Anybody else? OK, they, it is connected to both, a worldview and uh, I have one particular student who's ninth generation San Antonian, and his first language is Spanish. Okay? There's a historical connection to that. It's not because his parents are ignorant and they don't value the English language. It's because his parents want him to be bilingual and to maintain the culture that they come from, which preceded the culture of the United States. And this student came into my class knowing that. Okay? He didn't have to read Montejano, Anglos and Mexicans in the making of Texas for them. <laughs> so, and also what it does is it allows me to see patterns in writing, okay? Because if you are a Spanish speaker first and you learn to be literate in Spanish, there are going to be times when your ideas come out in Spanish and you write Spanish and English, okay? And it's not the same structure. So, so I, I like to help them identify those things so they can strengthen how they write. Okay. Um, the next one has to do with nativity. Okay. I want to know where they come from, where they're born. And I want them to be able to make those connections to the ancestral line. The next one is ethnic identity. Okay. Many of us say, who cares? It doesn't matter. It matters very much because sometimes ethnic identity is the only life raft they have in the context of their sociocultural interactions in our society. Then I asked them to talk about religion. Surprise, surprise, 
You know, all the great grandparents came here as Catholics, and the majority remained as Catholics. Even though many of my students may not be, um, they have an opportunity to talk about it and connect it to culture. Maternal and paternal immigration patterns. Even though they claim that they're American in, and not in, as it pertains to the continent, but, but as it pertains to the surname, surname of the United States, okay, they um, find out, lo and behold, my father came swimming the river and I had no clue in some cases. In other cases, uh, all of the grandparents, or in this case, maternal and paternal great-grandparents, because these are people that were born in the 90s. Okay, so I'm talking to really young people. And you know that they came through the, the struggles of the Mexican Revolution. And that some came as, as descendants of peasants who worked in the haciendas, and others came with wealth and riches to create another life here. And so we're able to look at that stuff. And they're not reading uh, other history books. They're, they're learning their stories. The next one is maternal and paternal occupation and employment. The reason I ask them is because oftentimes my students think that their family is stupid, uneducated, dumb, unable to find other kind of work like the friends work, you know, they're doctors, lawyers, whatever the case may be. And they come to realize that there is a structural um, constraint that they've had to work with. With the organization of the Texas history, they, their parents, most of them, uh, work still in a dual wage market where they make Mexican wages and they take Mexican jobs, not any white jobs, by the way. Um, maternal and paternal education legacy. Many of the students carry shame about the lack of literacy and the lack of education in their family. Through this activity, they're able to identify that as late as 1972, the state of Texas, by law, had an edict that said that no Mexican can go to school beyond the seventh grade because they were needed to work in the fields. If you want references, I can give them to you. And so they're able to understand that in a working class uh, family and in a working class group, the priority is always education. But education has very different meanings in the context of their experience. If they're looking at educación, which is being civil, knowing how to treat people, having respect, etc., or whether it means that you have the formal opportunity to gain a formal education. And so they get to understand that the great grandpa, grandpa, grandparents on both sides had zero education because they worked in agricultural work and there was no opportunity for education because there was migration involved with it and other things. The next one is then I have them look at their movement. And I think this is particularly important for those people who are not ethnic and tied to agriculture because this is where the military uh, students who come from a military family are able to talk about the meaning of migration and the meaning of displacement and finding yourself in another place. So I have them track their migration uh, map. And then they look at the first three moves, the current residents, and then they can elaborate on that. The next one is their schooling trajectory. I want to know what neighborhood they grew up in, and I want to know what that neighborhood was like. Because we're going to talk about um, economic gentrification and urban development is one of the books that they're going to read about. So I want them to understand what's going on in Beacon Hill in San Antonio, for example, what's going on in, in the south side, you know, with the destruction of mobile homes and the, and the building of uh, palatial uh, condos. And so then I also want, want to know what high school they went to, and I want to know um, if they attended uh, public or private school and, or a mix. The next one is they get to tell me if ethnic identity is important or not and elaborate on why either of the two responses. Uh, one of the things I'll never forget, this is the time we connect back to the social identity. Okay? They will bring out more history about racism, classism, you know, uh, heterosexism, and homophobia, believe it or not. Okay? And then the next one is the meaning of education because I want them to reframe the way that they're hearing that Mexicans don't care about education at the university, when in reality all they ever heard was about the value of education and education being the only way out. 
Okay, so the NIA says the generation in college, and I can tell you that with the exception of four people, every one of my students was the first generation. And then I identify what their parents were, and we find that out. Then they get to name themselves, and I tell them this is a process of you do it, nobody does it for you. And this is where they find out that those categories have meaning and that they have connections to power structures that decided how this were going to be used. Then um, we talked about stereotypes uh, that they learn in school, uh, in the family, and then how they feel when people use them. And they get to tell me a story about a Mexican relative. Okay? Then I close the conocimiento by coming back to immigration, not just as an issue, but to get a story on the paternal and maternal side. And one thing that they learn about their family and themselves as they went through the process, and that's the end of the comments, okay? You don't get to ask questions yet, but you will. Okay. I, I expect you to ask questions. If not, don't, don't be surprised that I point at you and I apologize because um, because I'm a good one for putting people in the spot or asking questions. If I'm connecting with you and I think you have something to contribute. So why do I use conocimiento? I engage this pedagogical praxis because conocimiento creates student communities of learning that will last for a lifetime. Conocimiento challenges the myths of learning as an individual process. This approach builds social support networks for students to successfully complete their education. Also, for the first time, learners understand the ways in which social structure has carved out the spaces and places that inform their lack of options or upward mobility, education, and employment options in their family legacy as they claim their respective histories. Finally, Collaborative writing activities expose the students to alternative ways of writing. As they develop their voice to write their family histories and their words, they let me illustrate some narratives for you. And I'll begin with the first student, but not before, you, before saying thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. A graduating senior, a first generation female in her late 20s, who reflected on the course said, the biggest thing that I took away from the talks with my parents, the class and readings, was the sense of community, the importance that was placed on knowing that I was part of something much bigger than myself. The idea that I was simply just a student fell by the wayside. I was more than that. Like the author of one of our books, I was the daughter of immigrants. And like another book, I could connect to the stories from several women in regards to their standing in a Mexican machista community. I had heard stories and learned lessons of those that came before me, and I was grateful for the road they paid for me. I wanted my family to understand that I heard their struggles and that they were not in vain, that they were part of a larger group of people who also left what they knew and loved behind in order to try and make a future in a place of which they knew very little. For me, there was an immense sense of pride, but also a feeling that a new journey had begun once the class was over and the books were read. I was no longer just a Mexican-American student. I was a young Mexican-American woman who had the chance to learn not only from her family, but also about what it meant to be Mexican or Mexican-American in the Southwest. And that I was more than just a person. I was now a person who understood the struggles and sacrifices of many before me, and it was now up to me to pass on those lessons. <clears throat> Next, a sophomore first generation male in his late teens, adding, the exploitation that Mexican communities fa face today is a mirror image of the blatant discri discriminatory practices that were adopted in the early 19th century to expel Mexicans from the Southwest. The racism that was aimed against Mexican people is much more discreet today than it was in the 19th century, but is no less effective. 
Mexican schools are still underserved and Mexican communities still have limited access to public services and education. Mexican families continue to face insurmountable odds. They still overburden the women of the household and they still battle every day not to have their culture overtaken by commercial European exceptionalism. Still, our persistence and ingenuity are successful weapons against the colonial plagues of racism, sexism, and poverty. From a first-generation junior retired veteran in the late 30s or early 40s, we hear, I have learned that hanging on to regrets and bitterness clouds the mind and withers the soul. In all the years of taking college classes, I have never come across a professor who makes us see life through the lenses of our past. Writing this paper was both painful and cathartic. The path of migration has shown me that I come from a resilient and courageous people who are willing to take risks. While my education got off to a bumpy start, I learned that perseverance leads to success. I came to the realization as I wrote about employment that I followed in my parents' footsteps. As a teenager, I worked in the cotton and corn fields, thus my life in the military. During my years of service, I spent over half in field, du field duty. I wrote my story so that it could not be erased or written by somebody who does not know my truth. An immigrant in her early 30s with a college education who came to the United States three and a half years ago adds, this class provided me with very rich readings that helped me understand not only the Mexican-American culture, but also the many ways in which it connects to my own history. By doing so, I have realized how important it is to be aware of our own heritage and how close Latin American cultures are. We can focus on our differences or our similarities, and again, our similarities are so many that we usually overlook them. I believe I have become a better teacher already just by getting to understand where most of my future students will originate, their histories which sheds light on many issues that are still current today. I still think that the similarities among Latin American cultures could be used to teach future bilingual teachers of the importance of value in each person's origin. I am very grateful to live in a country where I could come in contact with a variety of people, each with their own treasures to share and be able to find myself every day in my contact with others. Finally, a retired veteran states as part of the conclusion of his 15-page essay, this is just a part of my life, sto my life story, and only a small glimpse into the areas of moving and education through those years. The course that this middle-aged Anglo male started over two months ago has only helped me to start opening my eyes and, minding, and reminding me when looking at the past to analyze the present and prepare for my future. As you can see, Conocimiento allows us to engage and connect with a, core concept, with a course concept under study, regardless of ethnicity, class, or gender. In addition to unearthing family histories and what could be construed as a purely genealogical activity, students learn to place their history in the context of the social histories they studied. The incorporation of Texas, with, which examines the creation of a dual wage market where Mexicans were relegated to agricultural work. The Americanization Methodist movement in Paso, Texas to the Houchin Settlement House. The immigration movement of poor peasants because of the Mexican Revolution. And the urban development or removal of Mexicans from the center of Tucson and other such parts of San Antonio to make way for urban development and an economy of tourism. With a conocimiento, students understand the racialization of their ethnicity. They can name the socioeconomic trends and patterns that have kept their relatives in agricultural and service work, including the itinerancy of their ancestral migrations to the agricultural fields of the nation. And they place in context the miseducation or low level of literacy among their ancestors attributed it to a structural factors removing the blame from their legacy and taking the shame out of not coming from an educated lineage. Finally, they reclaim their family and social history as citizens of this nation whose ancestors have contributed much 
to building it. Thank you. Okay, so I get to see you now. So my glasses, where are they? Okay. Yes, sir. Would you comment, please, on how you deal with students who feel excluded when they're asked, for example, to list whether they're male or female, and they're not quite sure, and when they're asked to write about their father the paternal side when they don't know anything about their father the paternal side, when they are mixed ethnic background, they might feel excluded. <coughs> First of all, you have to remember what I said initially, is that students write what is for them. And whatever truth they bring, bring into the classroom as their history is what they work with. I have had students who say, I don't have a family because they're adopted. And I said, well, that's unusual because in the Census Bureau, we have families categorized as uh, you know, socially constructed families by adoption. That would be your family if you want to write about them. And so my intent is not to shame anybody or to exclude anybody. The reason that I included, I could have included more from the, from the veteran who was in my class, uh, because his, his, his essay was um, jarring, okay? Because he came into the realization that even though he was the only white man in my class, that the months that he spent in, my, in, in, in the class where he felt not part of was not because he was excluded. It was because he, for the first time, was not in the majority of people that he relates to or interacts with. So what he was able to extract from that is that it felt different to not be in a, in a position of power, in a position of privilege, and in a position of entitlement. And so what he did, he turned, he turned that on his head. And he was able to go back to New Mexico as, as, as a military brat, that's his own word, um, and growing up with primarily Mexican descent individuals, and being the only one but being culturally Mexican, okay, and being put down by people who were white because he, he hung out with the Mexicans. And so he has this amazing analysis in those 15 pages. And this was a person whose first essay needed a lot of work. And he worked, let me tell you, to tell me his story. So when you do conocimiento, you don't do it to exclude, you don't do it to isolate, you don't do it to identify. People will say, well, I'm not a Mexican. What am I going to find out here? Well, um, it's not just for Mexicans. You know, you have connections to immigration. How soon they are may not be evident to you because you could melt into the pot. Mexicans in this nation will never melt into the pot. Okay, And so look at it. You'd be surprised. Invariably, I go to the fourth generation because there is an immigrant in their history somewhere along the way. And there is a reason why that immigrant came. And the reason they came is connected to the reason Mexicans come. Okay? I can go as far back as the potato famine, or I can go to you know, um, other wars in Europe, different parts of Europe. And so they're able to find similarities and connections to what globally is a very organic process, which is movement for survival or self-preservation. Okay? And their stories are there as well. And so they have an opportunity to look at that. For example, that same young man who was a veteran, he found out in his family the saying was, these past don't worry about anything else when they did school. If, if you have a D, you'll graduate. Don't worry about it. Okay? And so he never thought of college as an option for himself. It was in the military, a career he was following because he came from military people, that he learned that college was an option for him and it wasn't made available to him. And so he made connections to ancestral legacies as well as students 
who might have been said that. So there's other, there's other responses. I have many responses to give you, but I'll stop right there. Any other comments or questions? Yes, sir. First of all, as a professor, I have to know what resources are available to me. And as a professor who uses you know, not just my intellect, but my emotional intelligence, as well as my cultural capital, in addition to having a PhD uh, in sociology, an MA in sociology, I also have an MSW. And I was a professor of social work. And I have clinical practice you know, with about 80 students following behind me who had their clinical training with me. So I'm able to read people, I'm able to read the environment, I'm able to gauge how things are going. And if, if students feel like disclosing something, I, they first come to talk to me and they test out to see if it's a safe space. And my point is to go back to them and say, do you feel it's a safe space for you? Because if you're not ready, you don't have to do it because this course is asking you to claim your identities. But um, I have had many individuals, and, and it surprised the, I'm thinking for a nice word. It really surprised me when, when one of my students disclosed that she was a survivor of incest. And I didn't see it coming. I suspected by what she had written to me and the conversations we were having and the back and forth tracking of her essays, but she didn't come out to me in writing. She came out to the class. And then she said, I can no longer carry the secret. It's not mine to carry, and it's not my burden. And she repeated something from my book that Las Hijas de Juan, and that's when I realized that she might have read it, and that's how she got you know, the reason to do that. And uh, this semester, I had one young man who came out as uh, you know, questioning sexually. And, and he did it because he wants people to understand that it could be anybody sitting next to you. And so the kind of environment I create it's not one that prods and pushes people to do what I expect them to do. It's for them to do with their self-conscious and aware knowledge what it is that's gonna feel safe and comfortable to them. And I, I, I make sure that, that I create that space. Okay. For more information, please visit tlu.edu.